started. Good afternoon and welcome to our first e-workshop brought to you by Demand Metric in partnership with Marketing Experiments and ThinkSpreeze. My name is John Follett, uh, Chief Analyst and Partner here at Demand Metric. Our topic today was chosen by you, our audience, building an effective, sustainable media relations campaign. The goal of today's e-workshop is to educate you about media relations and to help you become more strategic in your thinking. During the next 45 minutes, we're going to use our premium toolkit to help bridge the gap between education and execution. I'd like to begin by outlining the deliverables of today's discussion and by giving our speakers a brief introduction. And then I'll pass the torch to Jerry Rackley, where he's going to pick up and help us understand the intricacies of media relations and what we can do to improve our capabilities. So, the deliverables today. Our premium toolkit, it was designed to help you benchmark your current maturity level so that you can show measurable improvement over time. We've also uh, included a public relations plan template, a media relations database, a press release template, a media coverage analysis tool, and a media specialist job description. As a bonus, we've given you access to our best practices report. Uh, this report is a step-by-step -step guide. It's called Building Successful PR Campaigns, and it actually links to the toolkit on the Demand Metrics site, where you can watch very short tutorial videos on each of the tools uh, provided today. So our first guest speaker is Hunter Boyle, a familiar name to those of you in the marketing experiments community. He is Managing Editor at Marketing Experiments and is very well versed in multi-channel marketing communication. Uh, Hunter has 14 years of experience, and we're happy to have you here on the line, Hunter. Thanks, John. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you clearly. That's great. Can you great. Uh, just tell our audience a little bit uh, about marketing experiments and the Demand Metric Partnership? Absolutely. One thing that uh, our audience at Marketing Experiments, uh, many of you probably know, we do a lot with optimization and tools. And one of the reasons we thought it would be beneficial to put together this series with Demand Metric is they have a great set of tools. They span a lot of different aspects of marketing. And uh, it really makes a lot of sense for uh, the media relations topic in particular and some of the tools that you'll see today that Jerry's going to walk through. I think will be very beneficial, and we'll talk a little bit more about how those tie in optimization and marketing throughout the presentation. Excellent. Yeah, we're excited to uh, to work with you guys as well. Um, of course, our next speaker here is Jerry Rackley. He is our expert analyst today. Jerry is the executive director of corporate marketing at Southwest Bancorp, and he also owns and operates a media relations consulting practice. He has over 26 years of experience, uh, so thanks for being here today, Jerry. Glad to spend my afternoon with you. Sure. Thanks. Well, we want this to be a very interactive e-workshop, so if you have a question, you'll notice a Q&A box in the top right-hand corner of your screen. Tanisha from Thinks Free, she'll be monitoring uh, all of your questions as they come in, and we read every single question and comment that you post. So. We'll do our very best to help you during this call. I'd uh, like to start things off here by getting a better understanding of our audience today. So we've created a poll. Uh, Tanisha, can you throw that up for us? What we'd like you to do here is uh, we'd like you to select the option that really best describes your current media relations uh, situation. So you'll see it on the right-hand side. We're going to give a one-minute time limit here. Uh, just pick the best option that suits you. If you've just started a media relations campaign, if you've never done any media relations work before, uh, maybe you're a practitioner, you've had a great deal of success in the past, or you're doing some media relations work with uh, varying degrees of success. I'm just going to give it a few more seconds here. Maybe 15 seconds, and then we'll close the poll. All right, and uh, let's get to the results here. It looks like uh, most of you 
fall into, uh, you're just beginning to do some media relations, uh, or you've tried before and you haven't really had any success, um, that kind of, you know, is uh, going to help us gauge the conversation moving forward. And I just want to start off by making sure that we're all on the same page here. When it comes to media relations, one of the most frequent questions that I get asked by our clients is, what really is the difference between media relations and public relations? Um, Jerry, can you shed some light on this? Sure, John. I'm happy to do that. Uh, let me pull this slide up, and let's just talk about the difference between media relations and public relations. Public relations is a pretty broad umbrella, and a lot of things fall under it. And I've put a few up here on the chart, and even really this little matrix isn't comprehensive. But certainly media relations is a big part of public relations. Investor relations fits under there, community relations, and then there's other. And that can include things like governmental relations. So understand all of these things could be public relations, but we're going to focus today, and our focus is going to be on the media relations piece. And so let's move forward to the next slide, and let's just look at a definition of that. And media relations is simply this. It's managing the flow of information about your company or organization through a network of relationships. And so that's what we're going to spend our time this afternoon discussing. And the goal of doing media relations work is simply this, that you get editorial placements, and not that you get any editorial placements, but ideally you get them in the places that will do you the most good. And those would be the places that your target audience or customer set are turning to for information. So that's our operational definition of media relations. And with that, let's move forward. And let's talk just a moment about why you do this. I think that really everyone who's on this call today has made a decision to invest in media relations. And probably it isn't a, a big uh, issue of concern for them, but let me at least affirm that investment that you plan to make. Why, why do this? Why spend time on media relations? I think that there's several good reasons, three of them on this slide, and the first is simply the impact. And that is uh, editorial coverage tends to have much more credibility than advertising. And you know this from your own experience. If you are looking at a publication on one side of a page, there's a story about a company and what it's doing and its products or services. And on the other side of the page is an advertisement, perhaps, about the same company. Most of us tend to look at the editorial coverage and view that as being more credible. The second reason is the cost. There are a lot of things we do as marketers to promote our companies. Media relations can be one of them that can be very, very cost effective. And typically it costs you less to make the impact through media relations than it does through advertising. Now, let me just pause and, and issue this disclaimer. I am not against advertising at all. In fact, I think all of us could probably understand and agree that Marketing 101 would tell you you need a balanced approach, and you do. So please don't hear me telling you you shouldn't advertise and you should direct all your resources towards media relations. I'm just trying to position one against the other. Finally, and probably the most important one to me, is simply that media relations is a, is a very good size neutralizer. And small companies can make the same impression, communicate as effectively as their much larger competitors. And there's room on that stage for companies of all sizes. And that's what I really like, that media relations will allow small companies to really compete very, very effectively with their larger competitors. So, with that said, let's move through uh, some more of this information. What we want to do is talk to you today about how to create a sustainable advantage. And from my experience, and I think Hunter probably can comment on this as well, a lot of companies decide they want to stick a toe into the media relations pool. And they do that and perhaps have little success or no success. Uh, and, and decide that they're just not going to spend any more time. It doesn't seem to be working. They get limited awareness and limited benefit from their single attempt and then retreating away from media relations. And that's not really what we would coach anyone to do. Uh, another approach often is to make intermittent forays. There's an understanding that there is some value, so let's, let's stick our toe in that pool, then we'll pull it out and then put it back in. And, 
And over a course of time, perhaps you do get some limited sales benefit. Enough people start to be exposed to who you are and your messages that are being placed out there in the media. But it doesn't give you the full effect you could get. What we feel like is the best approach is to make a commitment over the long term to doing media relations. And there's a number of reasons why you should do that, and you will only get these benefits if you have a commitment to media relations. One is simply that it's going to make your brand stronger. A lot of people want to influence uh, sales and customers who will buy from them. And so, yes, a sustained media relations effort will help you with that. The other thing that a sustained media relations effort can do is help you improve the perception of your company or organization with a lot of key constituents, whether it's customers, whether it's shareholders, even investors, and one that perhaps you didn't think of would be merger and acquisition partners. All of these are audiences that can be influenced favorably through your media relations efforts. And the last thing is what I have listed on the bottom of the slide, and that is if you do media relations well, it can really discourage the competition. Now, I'd ask all of you to just think for a moment about how it feels when you see an organization that you compete with get great coverage in some publication that really matters to you. They get it and you don't. How does that make you feel? Well, that's exactly what we would like to be able to do through our media relations efforts is, is make our competitors feel like they got passed over or left out of something that's very important in terms of media coverage. So these are just some of the benefits uh, of doing media relations on a long-term basis. So we hope that if you don't get anything else out of today, you'll understand that there's real value in making commitment to doing this work over the long term. Well, let's jump into the tools because part of what you're going to get out of this e-workshop is in addition to the advice, you're going to get a set of practical tools to help you do this work. So the first tool I want to take a look at with you is the Media Relations Maturity Assessment. This is an assessment that's going to help you establish a baseline of where you are today in your efforts across all the dimensions that you see listed here on the screen. And finally, the seventh thing is it will give you a set of recommendations. Let me pull this tool up on the screen. You're going to see things flicker a little bit as I do that. I will bring up my Excel application that is running the spreadsheet. And hopefully uh, we are seeing that. If I could just have some of my other panelists verify that they're seeing that on their screen. Do we have the media relations maturity assessment on the screen? John? It's coming in fine. Okay, great. Thanks. You're welcome. This is a tool that really is going to help you understand where you are right now. This is the place that you should start is with this tool. And the tools we're going to take you through really kind of build on each other. So this is your starting point. And the first thing we recommend that you do is take a look at just what is the awareness that you have with the media. So that's this first dimension that you see right here. We want to understand does the media know you exist? And that perhaps is a blunt way to ask it. But do they know that your organization is out there and what it does? And this particular first question here asks about the local media, the industry media, or the national media. You should answer this question based on what is most relevant for you. But do they know you exist? And then when you go through and use the assessment tool, you go over to the score box and you pull down this list and you answer uh, based on one of the numbers. So let's just say, for example, that you are starting out and the media doesn't really know much about you, so we're going to select two and put that as our score. As we go through this first dimension of media awareness, we're also going to ask about have you received any coverage? It's one thing for the media to know you, but have they covered you? So again, you answer uh, the question by scoring yourself here. And then finally, in this dimension, are members of your organization sought out as subject matter experts by the media for any of the stories they're working on or have done. So again, you would answer these questions and assess yourself in that area. So that will help you establish a baseline. 
before I leave this to mention, I would just say on this second question here, when we talk about coverage, I want you to notice the word meaningful. Uh, and really, you try to be as objective as you can, because when we talk about meaningful coverage, we're talking about coverage of substance, where your company or its products and services are the focus of the editorial coverage, or at least part of the focus of the editorial coverage. So that's the first dimension here. Let's scroll down and look at the next one. This is the positioning dimension that you need to assess yourself on. And when it comes to doing media relations work, really this is foundational and you need to spend time making sure your positioning is just right. And I think, by the way, we're going to talk to you at the end of our session today about a future e-workshop on positioning. But there's really two levels of positioning we're asking you about. The first one here is simply your company level. Do you have clear, articulate, well-developed positioning for your company that's understood by someone other than you and your employees? And then at the product or service level, the same question really. Does that exist? And I'll tell you why you need to know this. Because if you have not done the work to position your company and its offerings, then you will not be prepared to respond intelligently to what often is an impatient media. And you'll know this if you ever have a conversation with a member of the media and they ask you, tell me what you do. They're looking for what we call in the marketing business the elevator pitch. It's a lot like when you ask someone what time it is. They want to hear you say it's 4.20 p.m. They don't want to hear you tell them how to build a watch. So this is why you do this work. And then lastly, here on positioning, we are asking if you have not only developed the positioning for your company and its product, but have you validated it. So again, you would go over here and you would fill out the score that best represented where you were, and then we'll move on down to this third dimension. This third dimension is the one that asks about, do you have management support for the effort that you're going to make in media relations? You can have these other things exactly in place as they need to be. But if you don't have support internally from your own management, you're not going to get very far with your media relations efforts. So that's what all these questions are designed to discover. Do you have executive support for an ongoing, sustained effort? Uh, are the people in the company who need to be available to you, the executives, the experts, etc., are they available to help you develop your announcements and communicate news to the media, be available for interviews? Do the people who will speak to the media on behalf of your company know how to do it? Have they been coached? Have they been trained? And one that's perhaps the simplest of all but critically important is when someone from the media does approach you or your company, you never know how they're going to find their way in. So does everyone in the company know how to direct media inquiries, where they should go, how to handle them? These are all very important things because we want to make a good first impression. So again, this section will help you assess that support. You would simply go through here and score yourself uh, and then continue on. We'll see on a, on a tab here in a moment how all these scores fall out. Moving on to the fourth dimension of this tool the media relations expertise. And what we're asking about here is, do you know how to do this work? Pure and simply, that's what we're asking. Uh, in the first box, do you have a strategy or know how to create one? What about the alignment of your media relations strategy with your corporate goals and objectives? Do you have the expertise in-house to execute a media relations strategy, or can you get it? Can you hire it from the outside? Uh, either by bringing someone in or through an agency. And what about the communications piece? Do you know how to craft those? And do you know how to distribute them? Do you understand the protocol that you need to follow when you're interacting with members of the media? And Hunter can comment on this if he would like. Uh, but Hunter will tell you what it's like to deal with someone who understands the protocol and what a pleasant experience it can be versus when uh, a well-meaning company trying very hard to be successful in media relations, but it acts like a bull in a china shop because they don't really know how do you interact with the media. So that's what this part of the assessment's about, is to help you grade and rate yourself to see where you are. 
the fifth dimension is simply talking about your process. Uh, and we're asking if you, you, you know um, how to create one that is sustainable. And I would just point out a couple of things that uh, are on this particular section. One of them is this ability right down here. Let me go uh, point to it. It's this section here that talks about your ability to exploit the coverage that you receive from your efforts. And if you have that ability, you can get really the full advantage of the placements that you get from doing your media relations work. And then lastly is the whole section on uh, media relationships. And I'm, to me, I'm, I'm trying to get control back of my application. And I think I have surrendered that to Melinda. <laughs> I'm trying to make the, um, uh, scroll down on my spreadsheet and I'm not able to do that. Tamisha, can you? Let me go ahead and uh, take away uh, and give it back to you in one second. Sorry, I think I got a little. Yes. While you're uh, getting back control of that, I just wanted to touch on something that you were talking about uh, as far as relationships go. And I know you're going to hit this uh, in point six uh, of, um, of the tool here next. But it's really crucial. I just want to echo what you said here about taking the time to manage these relationships. And one of the reasons that a tool like this is so important, especially now with so many uh, distractions between social media, editors, reporters being pulled in so many different directions, this kind of tool really gives you what you need to manage these relationships and manage, you know, the time and the uh, investment that goes into keeping these contacts in line, setting up regular, um, you know, contacts and communication, things that really add value and that aren't just here I am showing up when I need to get coverage. You know, it's really a, a very uh, service-oriented relationship from the media side to the editors. And I think that, you know, by the uh, f uh, five or six different areas on that tool, it can really help you manage those in a way that gives you that organization that makes you stand out from just kind of doing it uh, off the cuff, and that really makes a difference to your media contacts. All right, that's a great point. It is really very, very relational work. Uh, in a lot of ways, I liken it to sales work, which is also extremely relational. But for your media relationships to bear all the fruit that they can bear, the relationship piece is, is key. And taking the time to build those relationships and maintain them and, and focus on that part of your whole process is what's going to make the rest of it go. So, Hunter, thanks for bringing that up. And that was the last section, by the way, of the spreadsheet that we were just uh, looking at. I'm going to go back into that spreadsheet just very quickly and show you the recommendations tab. And so give me a second while I pull that up. And you'll see that tab, uh, well, I think you will, if so I'm clicking all the right buttons. Tamisha, did we stop sharing that application? Is it still out there? Um, and it, you have to reshare it when I took the ball away. You have to okay. Again. Sorry about that. No worries. Okay, you hopefully are. everyone's seeing that again. Yes. The, the last section here is uh, the relationship piece we were just talking about. And all the questions that are there really help you assess, do you know how to create and build and maintain those media relationships? Uh, and so grade yourself and rate yourself on those. When you do all of these things, you're going to click the Results and Recommendations tab, and you're going to see here uh, a summary of how you've rated yourself in each one of these dimensions. And you can go through and look at the ones that are high and low, the ones that are in yellow, will have recommendations. And these are just high level. This tool is prescriptive to a degree. Uh, there's certainly a lot more that can be said about all these, but it's just a basic fundamental recommendation to hopefully point you in the right direction. And then the other piece to this tool, before we leave it, is the Maturity Index tab, which I'll click on that. And what we see here is we see where you are in your current state, and then there's a goal state. And you'll notice that the goal state 
and half a point higher. And we just have set that for you arbitrarily just to give you something to shoot at. And then, of course, there's the, the diagram that also kind of helps you visually see where you're strong and where you need to improve the most. My advice to you is use this tool now, and then after you have spent uh, a few months, perhaps four to six months, doing your media relations work, go back and assess yourself again and see what kind of improvement you've made. But this is the tool to start with. This is where you begin. So I'm going to go back to our presentation, and we're going to move forward now and look at some of the other tools. The next tool I wish to share with you is the public relations plan template. And there are several components to this, but this is the tool that you can feed your results from the maturity assessment right into this to help you write a plan to go execute. So what we'll do is we'll pull this tool up. I'll share that with you. We'll look at just a few things, and then we'll keep moving through the other tools. This tool is a Word document. The previous one, of course, was an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, the, the tool is broken down into sections. Here we have the purpose. It's, it's designed to be a way to lead you through the development of a comprehensive plan one that you create yourself. Let me scroll down to some of the other sections. I'll just touch on a few things here. This is, this is going to be your media relations playbook. So let's go through here and look at just some of the sections. I won't touch on all of them. Like the executive summary is fairly obvious. My advice is try writing that last. After you've gone through and developed all the other sections of the tool, then it's often really easy for you to go and write the executive summary. In your situation analysis, this is where you're going to describe some of the challenges that are facing your organization. And I'll tell you that the, the, your situation and the plan you create may look very different for a company, for example, that's getting some negative publicity versus a company that's not getting any, or for a company that has little internal support for media relations versus one that has a lot, or even on the expertise dimension. A company that has lots of expertise will have a very different looking plan than one that is just beginning to understand how to do this type of work. So document all that in this section of the plan. Uh, we go into the third section, which is the planning session, and there is an area where we coach you on developing objectives, and then on target audiences. And let me just pause here and make a couple comments about this. Now, who are you trying to influence with your plan? So if you're just starting out, then my advice would be pick the highest value target. We can all say we have lots of targets and lots of audiences that we want to communicate with. But my advice to you is don't be too ambitious at the start. Don't try to boil the ocean, but pick the high value target. And then in terms of the messaging, what do they need to hear? And this is where you want to refer back to any of the positioning work that you've done because all of the messaging for really all of your marketing communications as well as media relations really needs to come out of the positioning work that you've done for your company and its products. So we have an example, a set of examples here just to give you a feel for what that might look like. And then the strategies piece, I think that's fairly straightforward. I'm going to skip over that for now. And, and let me scroll up to the section on activities. And, and this is where we are asking for you to document what are some specific ideas or things that you can do. This is where I would tell you that you shouldn't limit your creativity. There's a lot of things you can do to get the attention of the media, perhaps even some, uh, some that might be considered outrageous. I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that. But when you're brainstorming, don't rule anything out. But do understand this that whatever things you come up with to do in terms of activities to reach the media, you're probably going to end up turning all of them into a communication in the form of a press release. So that's, that's probably the ultimate destination of lots of the things you do will turn into or become a press release so you can formally communicate to the media. Again, we have some tips and examples as we go through here. Uh, we recommend you develop a schedule. Uh, there is a section here on a crisis communication plan, and I will tell you that we didn't intend to spend time talking about how to develop one, but I would say you need to have one uh, in, to know what to do in case 
any crisis should occur, not just a PR crisis, because crises tend to turn into PR situations. But it probably goes without saying you don't want to wait until you have a crisis to develop your plan, because by then you're not necessarily thinking clearly about what you need to do. Uh, I want to scroll down to this fourth section, how to administer and evaluate your plan. And let's go to this section 4.3 on tracking. There are a lot of media monitoring services you can subscribe to and buy. I'll just give you a tip that works really well. Google News Alerts, they're free, uh, and it's a wonderful way to do something that doesn't cost you anything, to just see what is going on out there in cyberspace that is mentioning your name, uh, your product name, or issues that are of importance to you. So you can go and set Google News Alerts up and be pretty creative about the different search terms or triggers that would cause those alerts to appear in your email inbox. Understand that it's not going to be comprehensive, uh, but you'll be surprised at how much information you'll catch by setting up a Google News Alert that you might not see otherwise. Lastly, I think that we'll cover just briefly this notion of evaluation. Someone is going to want to hold you accountable, and they should, for results on execution of your media relations plan. So you need to ask yourself during the planning stage, how are you going to measure this? We're going to talk a little bit about that with the next tool I'm going to share. But you do need some sort of metric just so you can help keep score and know whether you're getting something done and whether, some, whether it's working or not. So that's a really quick flyover of this particular tool, but I think you'll find it helpful if you don't have a plan yet and you need to develop one. So I'll stop sharing that application. And let's continue to uh, roll forward. The other tool I'm going to show you today is the Media Relations Database. As I said, each one of these tools is building on the other. As you develop uh, a plan based on the assessment that you did, you're going to want to get started having meaningful contact with the media. So you just need a way to track that contact, who those contacts are, and even some of the story opportunities because I'll tell you that when you start this work and you really invest deeply in it, you're going to discover there's lots of information that you need to be able to organize and track and monitor because you don't want to miss something. So let me go out there and share with you that tool that we have developed that you'll get. Uh, we're calling this the Media Relations Database. So let me bring that up. And you should see on your screen the first tab, which is simply the Instructions tab. So let's go through these. It's real simple. There are just three tabs. The instructions are pretty clear. I just want to show you a few things. The first is a tab on Editorial Calendar Opportunities. We have pre-populated this particular tab with fictional opportunities that you might find on an editorial calendar. So what we simply do is we list the name of the publication, the type of story, so in this example we have a feature story in QRS magazine that's covering new widgets. And we have our, on our own just decided how important these particular features are. Some are very important and others less. And that's for you to decide once you collect all the information you can about editorial opportunities that you should pursue. As we scroll forward here, uh, we're going to look at, if I click the right button, <laughs> we're going to look at the deadline, and I'll, I'll make a point about the deadline, that there's typically two sets of deadlines you'll see when you look at editorial calendars and story opportunities. The first is simply what month does the story publish or run, and so we see that in this particular column right here. The more important deadline is what is the story deadline? So in this first example of the widget industry overview, the publication comes out in July, but the deadline for completion of the story is early June. If you wish to try and influence the content of that story, you will have need to have had contact with the publication, the editor or the writer of the story, well before the first of June, that deadline there. We have a column here for you to list internally who needs to own working this opportunity. Whose job is it to make sure all that communication takes place? 
Then we have columns here for you to notate the editor, the writer, if it's different than the editor, and then a status column, simply where does this opportunity stand relative to your involvement with it. And then finally, a notes column, which is a simple way for you to just, in a real short way, annotate what happened with regards to this particular story. So I will tell you in a moment how you can research and find opportunities to put in your database. For now, I just want you to see that there's a place for you to do that. The next tab is simply contact information. As you do this, you will collect uh, a lot of information about people you need to communicate with. This tab looks a little busy, but for a good reason. We have a place here for you to put the publication. So uh, there's a, a, a row pair. The publication right underneath it would be the URL for that publication. And then as we move to the right, here's our contact information. We have the editor information here. Something that I think is very important uh, is the preferred means of contact. And once you develop a relationship with these contacts, you do need to ask them. You need to know how do you like to hear from us. And they will express their preference, and you need to log that so you don't violate that preference. As I'm sure uh, you, you will hear from Hunter, and that's a, that's a quick way to make uh, an enemy or at least annoy someone that's very important to you. So all the contact information is captured here for all the publications. And again, there's just a notes section. Uh, for example, if uh, you, you need to put something about the status of a, of a writer, maybe you're on sabbatical for three months, you know, you can put something like that here. Real simple tool. It'll just help you organize a lot of the information you're going to need to have a handle on to do this work. So I'm going to stop sharing that application. We'll go back to our presentation. We've covered the three tools that I intended to show you today. Of course, there's other tools in the bundle that you're going to get. What I'd like to do now is just go through how do you find some of those editorial calendar opportunities to put in your database. There's probably more than two ways, but I'm going to cover two. One is just the old-fashioned look for the opportunities in the specific publication's editorial calendar. Another way will be to use an online subscription to an editorial calendar database. For now, let's take a look at a real editorial calendar. This is the first way, the old-fashioned way of just getting on the Internet, going to a publication's website, and looking at their editorial calendar online. So I brought Inc. Magazine up, and we'll just make an assumption that we have an important message, and our company positioning is all geared around entrepreneurs. So we take a look at this magazine and realize, well, this is an important magazine to us. But we see in uh, June, the June issue, right here, there's a, a feature on entrepreneurs we love. And perhaps we even have a tool or consulting services that we provide to startup companies or entrepreneurial companies to help them to do valuation work. Well, this looks like a pretty important feature story for us. So we would record this into our media relations database, and we would pay very close attention to the fact that this publication goes on sale June the 9th and that the national closing date is April the 30th. So if we're looking at today's calendar, uh, time is very, very short. If we wish to try and influence this story and get some content about our company or its services in this story, we have perhaps two days left in this month to try and do that. So all that information would go on the media database that we just showed you. So this is one way to do it. As you can tell, it's a lot of work to identify all the media that you're interested in and then do this type of searching, but you can do it. There is an easier way, and that would be to subscribe to a, a service that does all the work for you. I have a screenshot of one of those services. Uh, we're not endorsing this service. It's one of several, uh, but it was one that I was aware of, so I'll just show you what the interface looks like. This is a tab you would see after you logged in. You could go and enter keywords to do searches and other parameters as well to govern your search. You could look at deadlines. You can look at geography. You can limit it just about any way you wish. So you would go and enter your search parameters, and you would then get a search result screen just like this. And you can go through and take a look at all these opportunities. Uh, I don't have the ability to scroll since this is just a screenshot, but you can see 
there's a scroll bar, and there's a lot more opportunities that are just not visible on the screen. So again, this gives us all the information we need to evaluate whether the opportunity is one we should pursue. These tools can save you a lot of work. They do cost money, and there are vendors other than TR Newswire that provide these services. Let's talk now about writing a press release. You're going to get a press release template from today's session. Uh, very briefly, the template will help you structure your releases correctly and pay attention to the form and all the required elements. Uh, if you've ever written a press release or taken a, a basic uh, journalism press release writing class, you understand the notion of the inverted pyramid. What you want to make sure you do is put the most critical information first in your release and then follow that by helpful information and then follow that by the minor details. So as you read a press release from top to bottom, the information typically is of decreasing interest. So you need to be good at writing a press release because press releases and the way you write them really indicate whether you're a, a serious player in the media relations game or not. Hunter, I'm sure you can comment on what it's like to get a very well-crafted press release versus one that was clearly written by someone who isn't really quite sure how to do it. Absolutely. I, I just wanted to throw one thing in there as well, Jerry, while we're uh, on the subject. And, and this slide was one that we had talked about before in particular uh, as far as what we do with optimization and with testing. You know, what we try and do is find out which variation works in which instance. We test a lot of different things. Press releases, it's very similar. As far as having a template like this, it gives you a really good structure and a good baseline to try and do different tests, for example, with your headline styles. Does a question work? Does a percentage work? Does a quote work? Does it, you know, what more can you provide than, say, a standard declarative in your first sentence, uh, in your intro copy, so to speak, is, is very much the same way. So this is a great way to kind of have that formal structure that allows you the flexibility to test these different elements with different editors, different reporters, different publications, and find out which works best, which approach works best for certain stories, certain venues, things like that. It's very helpful, and it's a great way to go. And Hunter, of course, speaks with the wisdom of someone who has received thousands, if not tens of thousands, of press releases in his career. I want to point out all of them. <laughs> and I'm sure you remember all of them. <laughs> let, me, let me point out, there's one other thing here. We have an asterisk. Uh, after a press release template, there is uh, really a great resource available on something that's new, and this is social media. Social media is opening up uh, entire new avenues for us to communicate to the media, and there is a social media news release template that was the subject of an earlier training session. It's available on demand for marketing Sherpa. You will see the URL there on your screen. Uh, I have looked at it. It's really fascinating and I think uh, represents something very new and important in terms of a trend we need to pay attention to. So I just wanted to point that out to you. It's one thing to write a press release. It's another thing to get that press release out there where the media can see it. So you need to have a distribution strategy, and you have a couple choices there as well. You can distribute your media releases straight to your media contacts, and I would say that's often a very good idea. You can send out your news through a wire distribution service. There are several. Or you can do both. Uh, let's talk about the, the pros and cons of that a little bit. I think that it's, it's very helpful for you to go straight to your most important media contact at least uh, and let them hear directly from you, of course, in the way that they would prefer to hear from you so they get their news versus making them go and find it on the news wire. Uh, moving along, let me just talk to you briefly about what the press release template will, will tell you to do. This is sort of a sample release. There's some key components here. You see the headline. In my experience, I'm just a big advocate of using the company name in the headline. When you understand how news gets picked up and distributed on the Internet uh, and summarized and capsulized and digested, often it's just the headline. Uh, that's visible to most people who are exposed to it. So I, I like putting the company name in the headline. In this example, I have the company name in the headline and the product name in the subheader. Uh, you see the other components here. There's a date line, and then there's the lead sentence. And I can't 
begin to uh, impress upon you how important it is to spend time on your lead sentence. I will tell you, if you spent an hour writing a press release and you spent 45 to 50 minutes on the lead sentence alone and the remaining 10 or 15 on the rest of the release, you probably have it just fine. That's how important the lead is. We developed these releases, again, inverted pyramid style, so that if someone read only the headline, they basically get it. If they read a little farther, they get just enough more. And if all they read was the lead sentence of the press release, they would have a very good understanding of what you were trying to communicate. That's how important the lead is. So, again, this, this is a picture of what the template will help you make your press releases look like. Okay, there's some other tools in your bundle. We're not going to open them up and take a look at them in the interest of time, but we have a tool that will help you track the coverage that you get. This is how you help keep score. I mentioned that earlier as we were looking at the PR plan template. You need to keep score. So you have the ability to use this tool to compare the coverage you get to the coverage that some of your competitors are getting. When you open that tool up and look at the instructions, I'll emphasize a really important part of it. Pick a, a bounded time frame to do this analysis. Uh, you might not want to try doing it across an entire year. That's a, that's a pretty long time. But maybe just a quarter or two months or even one month, and then you can continue to do those comparisons uh, as you move forward in the execution of your plan. There's just a couple of ways we have set the tool up to help you do the analysis. One is you just look at the sheer number of placements. If in the comparison period, you got 10 editorial placements and your closest competitor only got five, well, then you win. You had more than they did. That's probably not the only way you need to look at it, though. We have also uh, a way to help you understand how to measure ad equivalency, and that's simply if you look at the uh, story that ran and the, the space that it occupied, and you had to buy the equivalent space in advertising, how much would that have cost you? So you can look at it that way, too. There are probably lots of other ways to look at it, but these are two good ones to help you get started. We understand, of course, when you're looking at placements that not all placements are equal. You need to consider that some publications or media have greater reach or circulation than others. Therefore, they're better. Uh, and prestige is certainly big. As it says on this last bullet, there's a big difference between getting something in the Wall Street Journal or the Hoboken Auto Trader. And no offense to anyone who may be from Hoboken. And finally, in your tool bundle, there is a media specialist job description. So if you need to bring a resource in-house, this job description will help you hire the right person. And then a best practices report is also in your bundle on how you build successful PR campaigns. I think you'll find that report very helpful. We're getting close to the end, so let me start our wrap-up, and I hope you have some questions in mind, because I don't want to do most of the talking today. Uh, some myths, that is, companies begin their media relations efforts. Sometimes they, they buy into these myths, so I'm here to dispel them. Understand that editors don't read every press release they're sent. They can't. They get too many of them, and that's why it's so important that you understand how to write a press release well, and that you also understand how to communicate those releases to the media. Another myth is to believe that just because you pay the money to distribute your press release through a wire service, you are going to be guaranteed coverage because of that. It doesn't guarantee that at all. It just guarantees that it went out over the wire service. Often there's a lot of additional work that needs to be done to, to pitch or sell that release to the media. Another myth is that an editor will allow you to see and review a draft of a story about you. Sometimes you will get to see an advanced copy of the story solely for the purpose of fact-checking. But if you take issue with the editorial positions in the story, you are not going to have the ability to change those just because of a difference of opinion. You can change the facts if you're given that opportunity if the facts are incorrect. Another myth is that all the facts and claims that you make in your communications and releases are verified. That's not the media's job to do that. That's yours. You need to make sure what you say is correct. Now, I'll tell you, there's so many 
conscientious members of the media, they will attempt to do what they can, but if a mistake is in a story and it was in your, the same mistake was in your press release, then it's your fault. The other myth is that you think when you get started and you have some success and you get some coverage, then you should get future coverage because you've got past coverage, but that's not a guarantee. You have to have, you have to be giving something of quality to the media to merit the coverage that you get. And the last one, um, I'd like to hear Hunter comment on this one, is that because you advertise, you should get coverage in that same media. And I will tell you that if you understand how uh, organizations are structured, media organizations, there is a complete separation between the editorial side and the advertising side. They only come together at the publisher level. And even though you bought thousands or tens of thousands of dollars of advertising, if you try to lay that on an editor, you may just hear a click at the end of the line if you're on the telephone. Mm -hmm. Because they have no regard for how much you spend advertising. That's not what they do. They worry about the news. And Hunter, you can add your two cents on that if you'd like. That, that's exactly right, Jerry. It's, um, it's pretty much night and day. Uh, there are, you know, there are advertorials and publications and things like that, but Really, uh, most of what you'll be dealing with, they don't work together at all, and that won't that won't get you too far. In fact, it can backfire more than it can help if you were to mention or, or you know position that. It's just going to give you a black eye in the you know in the rep in the uh, perception of the editor or editors or reporters that you're dealing with. Absolutely. In fact, Hunter, I just add to what you said. Sometimes you'll be dealing with uh, what you think is a legitimate media inquiry, and they're talking about a story and including you in it, and you're the subject, and you're starting to feel really good about this. And then somewhere towards the end of the conversation, they'll throw out, and it will only cost you, and they'll, they'll list an amount. And if you ever have that kind of conversation, you know immediately you're not really dealing with a true editorial opportunity. That's advertorial, as Hunter just described. Uh, I'll close this slide with this saying I learned from uh, a PR pro I worked with years ago. Advertising you pay for, media coverage you pray for. There's no guarantee, but if you do your job well, you're probably going to get some nice coverage. I see Mary has a question here about how to initiate contact with editors for the first time. If you're just getting started, what do you do? Great question, Mary. Uh, I, I would go back to one of the fundamental truths that we shared earlier. And that is, it's about a relationship. My advice to you would be, don't make your first contact, whether it's a phone call or an email, to an editor and have it be a plea for coverage. I think that what you would ideally like to do is identify who are the really important people in the media and have an initial contact be something to just start a relationship, just to ask a question. Hey, I want to verify what are the things you're writing about now? What, what, what's your beat? You know, that's a great question to ask. And, and do the research. Don't be lazy about this because you'll frustrate them. Go and take a look. What have they been writing about? What do they seem to care about? And, and start a relationship by, you know, validating your understanding of those things before you ever really try to just pitch news to them. Um, but let me defer to Hunter because, Hunter, I think this would be a great question for you to take as well. Thanks. I, actually, I was I was sitting here nodding my head the whole time. I think you really nailed it in a couple of ways. Uh, if I could add a couple of things, it would be, one, uh, again, to, to reiterate what Jerry was saying, not just pitching but doing your research up front and just try and find a nice way to introduce yourself. Uh, a lot of times you hear stories about uh, job applicants, for example. You know, you get an email follow-up, you get an email follow-up, but someone sends in a card, you know, they just mail in a nice card, and it stands out for that very reason. 100 tweets a day, 65 emails, you know, an hour, uh, all these different things that we get, all these different channels now. Find a way to stand out that's, that's not too overdone, uh, and just introduce yourself and make sure that that editor knows what it is that you're covering and, and that you know what they cover that you really understand the news holes that they're trying to fill. And, you know, if it's trade pub that you know their audience, bring up some recent articles. Uh, you know, mention something that they have written before. It's, it's just 
relationship building practices 101. Find a good way to introduce yourself and get to know someone before you start asking, you know, do you have room to write about this? Great advice from a guy who is on that side of the table, or has been at least, that, that we're trying to influence. Uh, we have other questions, and so let me just pause here. I'm, I'm picking up the questions. I'll address them. I'm going to defer to my boss, Tamisha, about how long we can answer questions, but I will stay and answer questions as long as she lets me. So let me keep moving through those. Uh, Eileen asked a question about how does a small organization in the suburbs compete against larger, higher-profile companies in nearby cities for limited media coverage? Uh, I would answer that two ways. I wish I had a silver bullet to share with you, Eileen, but I will tell you a couple things. One is I think this all begins with how you position yourself. If you haven't developed positioning for your organization that helps you achieve that differentiation against those larger companies, then the task is going to be difficult for you. If you have developed that positioning, then it's a lot more, uh, it's easier to figure out how you can do that if your positioning already differentiates you from those competitors. I'm going to actually quote Hunter. Hunter, the first time you and I met and talked, you said something that grabbed me and, and stayed with me, and that was when you are working with the media, the mindset you have to have is not what can you get from them, but what can you give to them. So I will tell you that the media tends to really like stories about uh, your company's services or products in action delivering real benefits that are making a meaningful difference to those customers of yours that are using them. And so if you can give them that kind of information uh, better than your larger competitors, then you're going to get coverage. So that's the, the best answer I know to give you right now, Eileen, off the top of my head. I'll, I'll keep thinking about that. Uh, Robert asked a question about using wire services, uh, regardless of PR Newswire or Business Wire. Don't these services often end up being nothing more than a place where your competitors find out what you're doing? And the honest answer is yes, sometimes that's true, Robert. I will tell you that in my career, I have issued lots of press releases that never went through one of the wire services. I went what, the, the direct approach. I had my media database, and I prioritized who I wanted to contact with about a news release, and I started down that list and pitched directly to them. And so the only way my competitors would find out about it is when it showed up somewhere in print or online. So I, I agree with you. But there are times when you want to do this. And I would say, for example, there are certain announcements that you want everybody to know about, and, and that would be probably a product announcement. So why not put something like that over the business wire? If you're a publicly traded company, there are things you have to put out over one of the wire services. So there's my answer. I hope that's helpful. Other questions? Uh, Mary is asking... Uh, she's heard that social media releases should be written to include news. Also, what's the latest thought on press releases being sexy? <laughs> um, Hunter, do you have a comment you could make about that? Yeah, I want to throw to you first. Uh, certainly. As um, I, I was going to take the second question first, just because that one stuck out a little bit more. Um, press releases being sexy, I think what really makes them stand out is the quality of the information. Editors uh, or good editors or reporters, you know, they're subject matter experts. They understand the beat that they're working on. If you contact them and send over something that's just a little bit flimsy, um, not to be dismissive, but if it's not really a compelling story, they'll sniff it out in a minute. If you have a really strong case study, uh, if you have a... Um, you know, this could take on any form, but if you have a business partnership or a new product launch or something that yielded a really significant increase, uh, to kind of put it in terms of what we do, um, that's something that's going to get somebody's attention. What you really want to keep in mind there versus sexy is what is the audience for this particular editor or reporter's publication, what do they really care about in this story? And this goes back to what Jerry and I were, were talking about before. It's not so much what you can get, it's what you can give them. So it really comes down to putting yourself in the mindset of this editor or reporter, and that ties right back to the relationship. 
knowing their publication, knowing their audience, and really getting a feel for a story that would stand out and that would make them look like they're the editor of the year, that's the way that you can pitch them on uh, what you have as far as information or a news announcement. I think we're getting close on time, and John is trying to tug the presenter's ball back away from me, so let me close. Uh, it's rarely a coincidence when companies get press coverage. They get it because they are doing the work to get it. They don't get it because they have the best products or services necessarily. They get it because they have a good media relationships, media relations process, and because they've built those relationships. What I would tell you is this. If you haven't started, get started. If you have already started, Make sure you give yourself some time. If you look back after two months and say we haven't gotten anywhere yet, you haven't given yourself enough time. I always advise my clients back when I was doing consulting for a living that you need to give it at least six months before you begin to assess if it's working or not. So with that, I think it's time for me to turn it over to John and, and let him finish up. Great. Thanks a lot, Jerry. Um, and Hunter, Jerry, both of you, thank you so much for your insight today. Um, I've personally learned quite a bit uh, about how we at Demand Metric can improve our media relations capabilities, and uh, I certainly hope everyone else out there has as well. Um, just to touch base on a few upcoming uh, events, first of all, uh, Marketing Sherpa, the social media training that was mentioned earlier by Jerry, um, it is available online through the Sherpa store. So if you are interested in uh, social media and uh, media relations combined, uh, it's, uh, it's a great opportunity to, uh, to learn a little bit more. After the workshop, if you do have any additional questions, something that crosses your mind later on tonight as you're digesting some of this information, uh, feel free to either send us an email, uh, info at demandmetric.com, uh, or otherwise you can send it directly to myself, john at demandmetric.com, and uh, I'll do my, my best to track down an answer for you. Our upcoming webinar, uh, the next one, takes place on May 19th, and it's going to be about positioning your company and your solutions. Uh, Jerry is going to be our uh, expert analyst again. Um, I think he did a great job today, and uh, I'll be looking forward to that discussion as well. Also, marketing experiments. Um, they do a landing page optimization workshop. I've had an opportunity to attend one of these workshops uh, about six weeks ago in Miami. Um, they've got one coming up on the 21st and 26th in San Jose and Dallas. Um, they're giving you a $100 bonus if you, uh, or a discount if you sign up using uh, their discount code here for May 1st. And between the 31st and the 2nd, there's also the SIPA 2009 International Conference at the Mayflower Hotel in Washington. So I'm sure that you can get more information on that uh, at the Marketing Experiment Store, right Hunter? Absolutely. We uh, we have a couple of links on the blog. You can find the latest information there uh, and also through the Marketing Experiments Journal newsletter, and we'll keep updating those. By the way, just some of those questions that came in, uh, we'll try and see if we can get some of those answers on the blog there as well so that, you know, we can carry on the conversation with this topic. Excellent. Um, so if you've enjoyed the workshop today, uh, you know, we'd love if you could tell a friend We'll also be sending out a short feedback a questionnaire afterwards and poll. Uh, like I said before, we really want you to direct our research here at Demand Metric in this partnership with Marketing Experiments and Thinkspree. If you have any good ideas for new topics, please, by all means, let us know. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. So thanks again, uh, Hunter, Tanisha, and uh, Jerry, for your time today. We appreciate it. Thanks for all of you out there as well.